Welcome to the Road to Acapulco. There's a new idea in town, an idea that's been heralded by Bob Podolsky for 32 years. It's an idea that will change the world, and it's beginning to take shape in Acapulco. All right, everyone, uh, welcome to uh, the sixth, or is this the seventh, seventh edition seven. of yeah. the Road to Acapulco? Uh, I'm Michael Nimitz, and with me is Bob Podolsky, as usual. And tonight we have a, a special guest, two special guests actually, uh, Nathan Freeman and Lisa Freeman, who are the bedrock of our community, Aww. among other things. <laughs> uh, if you if you do hear some disturbances in the background, we're enjoying one uh, average Saturday in Acapulco. We're having a little party get together, birthday party for one of our. Uh, friends and expats here in Acapulco. But uh, today's subject is about peaceful parenting and the octolog. So before we get started on that, actually, I've got one question that I want to ask each of you, and that's got to do with just the octolog in general. When you first heard about the octolog, what was your impression? And then what got you to the point that the octolog made made some sense to you. So, Nathan, do you want to take that, the first one? Sure. Um, well, my first impression was confusion. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's because the people that were introducing it to me uh, weren't themselves entirely familiar with the subject matter. Uh, so uh, it very quickly became necessary to go through the source material. And I spent an afternoon reading Flourish. <clears throat> um, it made quite a bit of sense. Um, and it became clear uh, by the time I got to the end of it that what was being talked about was a methodology, which, and the prior conversations, that really wasn't, uh, we didn't realize that's what it was. Um, but it's a methodology for decision making and for creating new ideas. And uh, that made it sound pretty exciting. Um, and then when we looked at who was already involved in creating our first community, Octolog, uh, it was a group of people that both Lisa and I felt pretty strongly we, we wanted to work with. Um, so that was the way it came together. So I'm curious, what was the, what was the key point at which you decided this was for you? If that an octologue is something you wanted to be involved in? Can you remember the moment you decided Yes, that? yes. The key point was when we transitioned from being a group discussing the concept of having an octologue to receiving an invitation uh, to join in one with a group of people that I had, had mostly worked with already in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when they were able to define a purpose... Mm. for what the Octolog was meant to achieve. Um, that was the real big thing, because when we were talking about the concept originally, uh, Michael was very enthusiastic to create an Octolog, and and as he would talk about it, I was like, well, for what? <laughs> what is it going to do? You don't, you don't just say, well, I'm going to go into business with these eight people. We have no idea what we're going to do, but we're going to work together and create a, and create an enterprise that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, you, you have to have a sense of purpose. You have to have a mission. It was outside your box. Uh, well, I, I didn't think there was a box, <laughs> but it was outside my octagon. No. <laughs> um, but that, that's really what made the difference was the identification of, of a purpose. Mm -hmm. I like that. I think there's nothing more attractive than a good purpose. When it comes to organization. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. When it comes to organization. I was going to say, uh, Olivia Wilde. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Lisa? Um, let me get the first question again. What was the first one that we... How did you decide to be involved? Oh, uh, Nathan asked me, and I was slightly hesitated. I slightly hesitated because I didn't know the time... Uh, parameters and I'm a peaceful mom, uh, unschooled mom, so my number one dedication and job is the little people. Um, my number one job is the, is the little people, so 
and we have a third one coming. So my time that I could dedicate to another thing would be limited. So, but once I did get in and sit down and join one of the uh, meetings, I very much enjoyed it. Um, and it sort of, when something is done with integrity and ethics and with everyone equally involved with their opinions and, and input, it just seems like, why hasn't this been thought of before? <laughs> like, like, why does this seem easy for me to digest and to take on and be a part of? Why isn't this just infused in every aspect and in, in all the other areas in business and even in family? Um, and then I, then I realized, Nate and I talked a little bit after the first meeting and I told him, you know, it's kind of like we've been doing an octologue, but with our family. Because, mm -hmm. you know, peaceful parenting and unschooling, everybody has, you know, even um, rights and, and opinions, and um, we all try to make sure everyone gets what they need to be happy. And, you know, we, we are ethical people, and we're authentic people, so we follow, you know, we do morally what's right. And, and so Nathan and I were like, we've kind of been doing this already. Mm -hmm. So... But we've been doing it with little people, so we've been limited on how much we can really discuss. And then there's obviously age-appropriate material we can go go over and cannot go over. So it's exciting. And again, like when Ethan said, having a purpose, having a focus, made it even even more interesting because now we we can move forward and, and start gathering gathering our tools, if you will, to figure out what's the best thing for us to do to move forward so well, I want to say. welcome you to this technology it's uh, not new to me and it's actually not new some of the basics go back 3500 years there was a, a group that called themselves the Israelites and they organized in little groups of 10 and the first grouping was at the family level and then the community level and then the regional level and uh, so we had groups of 10 and tens of groups of ten, and so on. And this is a lot the way the whole amount of octologues comes together. So the idea, the fundamental idea, isn't new, but it's been refined a lot since those days. It's gone through a lot of changes. The Israelites would have been wildly successful had it not been for their warlike neighbors who took them over and, and, and who attempted to acquire... Uh, what what they had achieved failed uh, attempt, I might add. But uh, if 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 the attempt had succeeded, if that group had continued on without being interrupted, the world would be a very different place today, as you might imagine. So I am absolutely delighted that the two of you have decided that this is for you. Uh, Every time someone decides that, I feel excited, but I especially feel that way with the two of you because of who you are. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, we're talking about peaceful parenting as well. When did you guys get the idea of, of becoming peaceful parents? Was it right at the beginning, or was there some? Where, what was the point that you started out with? Sadly, no, it was not a concept that we were familiar with uh, prior to having children. Um, one, one, one child. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Meta was about two and a half. I think Axiom was a few months old. Um, at the time that I first heard about the concept from Stefan Molyneux. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he made a very persuasive case. <laughs> like he does a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and I ultimately decided that it was that living in a voluntary relationship with our children was really important to me. And I approached Lisa with this and um, she, at first she thought I was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> she, she literally was like, that cannot, that cannot work. There's no way. And I said, well, it's, it's what I'm going to choose to do. Um, and, and so I did. And that, like the very first long-term point of contention 
was uh, bedtime. It was the idea of bedtime. And I simply didn't want to force our kids to go to bed at any particular time. And I didn't want to force them to be uh, in some particular bed or some particular room. And that meant that Meta decided she just wanted to start hanging out with me late at night. Um, and so Lisa would be in bed with Axiom and Meta and I would stay up sometimes until one or two in the morning, uh, cause she wasn't ready to go to sleep, but eventually she would fall asleep because she was, you know, two <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's going to happen. Um, and after a while, she actually did learn to recognize when she was tired and she, she would put herself to bed. Um, but after doing this for about six weeks, Lisa came to me like really upset and said, well, this isn't fair because you're making, I have to be the bad guy about everything, right? Cause you won't, you won't make her do anything. So I always have to be the bad guy and make her do stuff. And I said, well, no, you don't just don't do that. <laughs> and she was like, what? what? I'm like, just don't, just don't. Cause your, your complaint is that I have a better relationship with our daughter than you do. Because I'm not making her do stuff. So you stop making her do stuff. And then you'll get that too. And so she did. And it worked. And it worked. And the reason for my um, shock... I, I actually remember speaking to one of my friends and I said, I think this is going to be our divorce. I think this is it. It's gone off the deep end. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> like, my daughter can just do whatever she wants and it's just like, I don't... They're out of control, you know? And Exactly. <laughs> and what it, what it basically meant was I had been brainwashed from my parenting, my parents' parenting of me. And the, par- the, the, the authoritarian paradigm of the mom and the dad do, you know, are in control, do as they say, and don't ask questions, was how I was raised. And I just thought, that's what you do. And um, there was... There was no trust in in me and my daughter and knowing that things would work out yet. And that's because I had to I for some reason thought if I was in control of them then I then I would know what would happen next. And being in control means being the authority on what happens in the house. And so when I started to release a bit of my control. I was also doing, I started doing yoga and meditating. So it really coincided perfectly with my own unraveling of my, my childhood patterns and trauma that did come up in dealing with poor parenting. Um, and slowly but surely it started to click. And man, it, when it clicked, it was, it was almost as if when, when I woke up too, I mean, there were stages of waking up a little bit from the, from the matrix and, and seeing through the garbage. But when it clicked with the peaceful parenting, it was like night and day. I mean, it, it was, it was, I could see the dysfunction in all the other parenting styles. And I didn't run around and point fingers and say, you're not doing it right. I just was sitting back as a witness to this, like, wow. The cycle of control and abuse and authoritative parenting was clearly not working, but people were still pounding their heads against the, the wall going, but it's going to work. I'll just have to spank them harder. I'll have to yell at them harder. I'll have to train them better. And it was like, to be like you, to be a zombie who follows the rules. And, you know, anyway, the, I can go on forever with that. But, um, yeah, it was night and day. And... Uh, Quickly, it, it became clear um, the parents that didn't do it and the difference in how their kids were with their with their family. And I was a teacher before um, Meta was born, and I already had a bit of a. I loved the kids that I was teaching, and they weren't. It wasn't a punishment to be there. Um, and when my kids, when it was time for the kids in my school to go home, they didn't want to go home to their mommies and daddies. Because the the parenting the paradigm at home was do as they say not as I you know not as I do I'm in charge and I was having fun with them and the parents unfortunately are stuck at a job where they have to work and they miss out on having fun with their kids and I got the best part of those kids and so 
that was another training that happened um, that I pulled from when we took on peaceful parenting. Um, Do you remember how we would go places and this was probably after two or three months of doing this. It, it, we would go to social settings or to restaurants or whatever, and people would just come up and be like, I can't believe how well-behaved your children are. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I... <laughs> and, we're, and we're like, they are. <laughs> it was, we, we did it, I don't think we even used the word behave. Like, it, yeah. it wasn't even in our vocabulary. I would. We would go to playgrounds and... When it was time to go, I mean, at any playground across the entire world, when it's time to go, when the parents make that decision, you see the kids being, in when they're younger, scooped up, literally, just in the middle of playing and taken away like a prisoner. And the kids would freak out. And we we built a whole, a whole thing around saying, how long do you think you want at the playground? And then we would be like, okay, how about 10 minutes? And they'd say 10 minutes, and we would do a countdown. And over time, parents would see this, and our kids would just leave the playground without the fighting and screaming and tantrum that parents would basically create. Um, and not know they created. Yeah. And, and my kids, Med and Axiom, have said to me many times, Mommy, that mommy doesn't peaceful parent. Well, that's a beautiful illustration. What's involved in peaceful parenting? I've, I've been aware of the peaceful parenting paradigm for a long time. And from my perspective, it goes back to recognizing that who we are as adults gets set up when we're really, really little, first five years. And those first five years are critical. And this is why we have, as part of the Octolog technology, we have the soul bonding technology, which deals with how do you recover from poor parenting? What's involved? And it can be done. You know, therapeutically, uh, we can recover and heal those childhood wounds that our parents inflict upon us so unknowingly. And I'm very excited at, at the idea that people are starting to wake up to parenting doesn't have to be this authoritarian thing that it usually turns out to be. Well, is there is uh, is there any value to the word or the practice of obedience? Does, does anybody feel that there's anything any value to obedience on the part of whom? Parents or kids? Parent or you know, children? <laughs> uh, children, obviously, you know, obedient children. Well, obedient parents tend to create obedient children. Uh, if you were treated badly as a child and it made you obedient as a way of compensating for your helplessness, you're likely to do the same thing to your kids. And this is why the education of parents and would-be parents, or maybe someday parents, is very, very important. This is, one, this is probably the most important thing in the world, because all of the violence that we see exhibited by adults is preceded by violence done to us when we're little. That's where we learn violence. It's, oh, it's okay to be violent. Guess what? I get spanked. It must be okay to be violent. I get circumcised. Oh, wow. Severe violence is okay, too. That's a norm. If you remember being circumcised as a man, uh, you would not feel that way. I remember my circumcision, and it was horrendous. It was horrendous, because... As an infant, I couldn't localize pain, and so the pain was everywhere. It was like my whole skin being on fire. And if you had such an experience and remembered it, you wouldn't do that to your kids. But most people don't remember it because the defense mechanism is to blot it out so that you don't have to keep remembering it and wondering when is the next time I'm going to be set on fire. <clears throat> So I'm very much in favor of, of what you now call peaceful parenting. I think of it as nonviolent parenting. I suppose that's the same thing. But for an infant, infants are so sensitive to what is going on with their parents that if a mother, for example, a young mother, she's uh, gave birth a few weeks ago or a week ago, and 
if she is depressed, if she is distracted, if she is stressed out, then from time to time, when she looks at her infant and the infant looks back, expecting a certain kind of caring reaction, the mom doesn't always do that. Sometimes the mom will look at the child as if she hates the child because she doesn't want to be a mom right now. And the child registers that. And it's damaging to the child. It affects them the rest of their lives. And if we uh, could remember that as adults, then we wouldn't do those things. You're not going to do to your children something that you hated having done to you. Sure. Push. There you go. So for me, peaceful parenting is a natural response to recognizing the damage that is done by parents who insist on controlling their children. And if, be, if children being out of control is the concern, it's also of the liberation. Being out of control means you're not being controlled. Oh my goodness, if I'm not being controlled, guess what? I get to determine my own fate. And life gets a lot better. So my hat's off to you guys for what you're doing. I really, I wish my parents had done that. You know, I spent 10 years in therapy getting over what my parents did, and they were pretty good parents. I've, we've actually heard many people in our community say, um, and often in tears, that they, because of watching how we are with our children, they are seeing how crippling their childhood was to, uh-huh. to where they are in their life and their happiness. And some, some of them have, are past that point where they can have children, but we also have friends that never wanted to have children that have spent time with us at our home um, for different different amounts of time that have left and said, I want to have kids now. This is an example of parenting that I didn't think existed. And I now want to do it. Like, if this is this is something I'm really going to pursue. And um, that's huge because the people that, that, um, that I'm speaking of are brilliant people. They're awake. They're compassionate. So again, you know, bringing more of those little human beings in with that style of, of parenting and coming from parents that are, you know, intelligent is only going to create a stronger, a stronger community for us. And um, it's the best compliment I've probably ever had is to have somebody say, "I wasn't going to have kids, and mm-hmm. now change my mind." You know, yeah. Good for you. I, it's, it's probably worth pointing out that peaceful parenting or, or nonviolent parenting is really not an adequate description for what we do um, any more than anarchy is an adequate description for the overall philosophy of volunteerism. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's not, it's not just that we don't control them. Um, it's that we negotiate absolutely everything as a family, all decisions that we all decisions we make where we're going to do something as a family are unanimous. Mm -hmm. Um, And anyone can back out of uh, a decision at pretty much any time. I mean, for at least the most casual things. Some Obviously, there are some occasions where when you're committed to something, you have to follow through on it. But, you know, once we go over to visit a friend's house, we have to be there a certain amount of time before we can leave. Otherwise, it's rude. but they understand that even before we set out, uh, and and we make plans for what we're going to do when we get there, and um, we'll talk about how long we're going to stay. Um, we'll do a countdown on when uh, people are ready to go home. Um, we uh, we tend to not uh, we don't control like when they can have access to. Um, uh, videos or movies or stuff on their iPads. There's no like, oh, you can only do, you know, 20 minutes of screen time, whatever. There's none of that. Um, and we're, we've even got to the point now, <laughs> we're still, there's still some, a little bit of struggles around this, but giving them a great deal of freedom about what they can eat. Um, but the, the battle that Lisa and I face is I've, um, she tends to have a little bit more of a sweet tooth when she goes shopping than I do. Not for me to eat, but for the kids. And I and I find I don't know why, because I, I know that they love it. And I and 
we go through so many cycles and phases of what they're eating. And right now they're really not eating a lot of bad stuff. And no, their eating habits have gotten a lot better. Yeah. Uh, since, since the more freedom we give them, the better their habits get. Yeah. But it's, and it's so, so counterintuitive. And you'd think all this other stuff we're doing that's counterintuitive, we would have figured this out by now. But it's, it's so hard to let go of like, yes, you can go get M&Ms out of the fridge anytime you want. And we've done that. And, <laughs> and they'll, you know, a few times they'll go out of, they'll get a little out of control. And then they'll have the, the symptoms and the side effects of that. Oh, my stomach hurts. I feel sick. Okay. Well, do you now, do you, let's remember this and what can we do to, to make ourselves feel better? And, you know, we just, we let them experiment, really. Um, but I, I do, when it's dinner time, because of our family dynamic, I usually make five, six different things. Like, I have fresh fruit and strawberry, or fresh fruit and vegetables out. Just as something to hold them over. And then I, you know, I make a bunch of stuff. And, you know, so everyone is getting something they like. And, um, and because they're seven and five, they'll eat the same dish for two weeks straight. You know, this week it's fettuccine Alfredo, and that's mm. what we're going to eat. Um, so, it's what's interesting is we now have it. Um, we now have like a, a, a an album. Like when you when you're looking at a, a photo album, there's pictures. And when you first start doing peaceful parenting, you only have like one experience, and then you have like twelve experiences. Now we have. Five five years of experiences, would you say? Mm-hmm. So we have a bigger, like, sample of what it, what our experiences are going to be like with them. So we understand um, how to negotiate better with them. Sometimes I don't. I'm just like, you guys want five evidence for <laughs> for something? And Nathan's like, really? You start at five? What about two? You know? What's the? <laughs> and I'm like, sorry. <laughs> There's actually one morning I remember waking up. <sighs> And I said, what do you guys want for breakfast? Cake and ice cream? And I'm like, why did I just say that? And like, it came out. Like, I don't think, I hadn't had my coffee yet. And I was like, what the hell just happened? And I didn't, I didn't, once I said that, I stopped and looked at them. I didn't say another word after. And they just looked at me. I, I wanted to see if they actually heard what I said. Because like, I was going to like, just kidding. You know, like April Fool's. You know. We had ice cream and cake for breakfast that day. And it was okay. <laughs> Awesome. You know, like <laughs> don't say cake and ice cream. Don't say cake. And ice. Who wants cake and ice cream? <laughs> really? <laughs> Jeez. It's it's interesting. You know, essentially what you describe is mm-hmm. is a big part of the octalog, the unanimous decision, where every member gets the ability to reject the whole idea, the whole the whole project, or, or whatever the whatever the objective is. Each member gets. 100% ability to reject. That, uh, you know, a lot of people would say that's, you know, that's impossible. Nothing is ever going to happen. You know, the fact that you guys are practicing that with your children, it, it seems like, you know, certainly that's impossible with children, you know. <laughs> children can do it. You know, well, so if children can do it, then it seems like, you know, the, the idea of an octalogue even has more validity than that. But I think that's one of the big objections that a lot of people have about the Octolog is that you're never going to get anything done. Which, of course, is not true. It is It is time-consuming. For Our experience is time-consuming in, in, in trying, sometimes, in getting everyone happy. But again, it's practice. The more you practice it, the more you understand where people where people's needs are, you can get to a, an easier, quicker negotiation um, than you say you said than when we first started two, three years ago, five years ago. So, but it, so it is time consuming. I remember this last conference, Dana Martin and her whole family were with, with our family. We were out by the pool. She had her whole family of five and there was, um, I had my two kids and I had another another speaker's kid. So there was probably eight to ten of us. And we all wanted to do something different. And we all just said, okay, let's sit down. Let's everyone discuss what they want. And 
figure out where can we pull like you know if there's a time concern we need to work we need to think about the time concern and the elements of that and there wasn't a time concern there was people who were getting hungry but that was they were saying it was flexible it was in the next 30 to 45 minutes they needed to eat so we had some movement and it, it's kind of it's great problem solving practice you know you really have to see all of the resources you have at, at your hands and where and what you can do and who you can call on and um, you get really good at it, you know, and it's, it's great too in socializing at parties and stuff, because when you need to move, you know, a party a certain direction, you, you can kind of drop some hints and negotiate and next thing you know, you're doing the limbo and you're <laughs> so. But does it, does it also mean that you're, you're doing things more creatively? We are. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely more creative in what we do. The um, Axiom, he's five, and he out-negotiates me all the time. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, People and, often and, underestimate the capabilities of children. Yes. good example of that is many years ago, I met a group. Uh, I was introduced to a group of people who actually had a commune. And it was an unusual commune. Instead of thinking of, some, of themselves as seekers, they decided they were finders. And they called their group the Finders. And the issue came up of control of money. And the group, the, the, the parents in the group, there were parents and children in the group, and they were doing very well with managing money. So as an experiment, they decided to let the children manage the money. Hmm. Think about that. Let your children manage your money. Well, for a few days, there was too many sweets and too many, you know, too many things to eat that uh, weren't really that good for people. But the kids got over it, and within a matter of about a week, things seemed to change, and the kids became really good money managers. They were better at it than their parents. So whenever money would come into the group, it would be handed over to the kids, and they would take care of it. And they did a really good job. Now, who That's would imagine that? You know, if you didn't know that that actually happened... Who would imagine that was even possible? It doesn't surprise me at all, actually. Now, <laughs> yeah, now that you have this experience with your kids. It's, yesterday, we were at the at, uh, the toy store. We were doing some Christmas shopping, and um, ax- there was something Axiom wanted, and, and he he turned to Lisa and said, "Mommy, I re- it was the it was the bear. That's right. It was this yeah. giant stuffed teddy bear, bigger than him." And and he goes, "Mommy, I really want the bear." And she goes, well, where would you put it? And he says, oh, that's a secret. If and she's like, well, what, you can't tell me where you're going to put it. And she goes, he goes, well, you'll see when I get it home. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's that's, the only way. The only way you're going to get your question answered is if you buy me the bear. <laughs> right. I was on the floor. <laughs> Right. One, the very first Christmas we did peaceful parenting, or maybe it was the second. Um, we we also don't do Santa, so we don't we don't manipulate and, and lie to our children. So they knew we were getting them gifts. So we picked a number of how many gifts they could have, and they had picked out what they wanted. And then we would go to the store just to get groceries, and they would end up looking at the toys, and they would want another toy. And I'm like, well, then we have to take off a we have to take off a toy that's already on your list. And they thought about it and like, oh, that sounds like too much work. But then sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there were toys and like, okay, so we have to go back to the original list and like move some stuff around. Um, and it usually never ended up happening. They were, they were pretty set on their toy list. So it was, it was interesting that that actually happened. Cause when, when Juan and Kevin get here, they'll, um, we, we went and got a Lego set at the store like 800 pieces and they'll, they'll, that will be very entertaining for them to play with Kevin and Juan because they, they are little Kevin people. and Juan or for the kids? The, both. The kind of both. Kevin, and, Kevin and Juan love Legos. <laughs> yeah. Oh and that's another thing we, we've noticed most of our friends here are adults and our children get along great with adults and our adult friends seem to enjoy spending time with our little people and I remember as a child really not getting along with adults um, because it was just not a, it's just not what you do. You hang out with people your own age because that's what you're confined to in school is your own age group and your grade. 
And you never learn how to speak to adults. You never practice that. And I was the opposite. Oh? I never learned how to deal with children. Oh. I got along great with adults when I was a child. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Said something about my parents. I'm not sure what exactly. Well, knowing, knowing that, you know, a great deal of what people's character is has to do with their early childhood. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the fact that the octologue is, is essentially, with the soul bonding portion of it, a, a way to work through those issues. Uh, uh, parents that already have children and have raised them to, you know, a level where you know they they've had conflict where they wanted their child to be obedient and so forth. What do you think about using the octolog as a as a potential model for parents to change the atmosphere in the household? I, I think um, an an example. They'd have to see the example. I I truly believe. Most people don't have an example of how it works. And when they do... The, the, the starting point of the octologue is the ethic, mm-hmm. right? right. Yeah. And the starting point for our parenting, for our move first to peaceful parenting and then to voluntary parenting, was ethics. Right. Right? I mean, the, the non-aggression principle was something that we had already agreed was the right idea. We already thought the state was ridiculous. Um we already believed in not having authority and, and we're both atheists too. So that helps, <laughs> right? So there's no, no religious, we didn't recognize any religious authority or state authority, uh, and held the non-aggression principle as the, the primary way that people should interact. So turning around and realizing that we needed to do that in the home, just as much as we hoped for it to happen in the rest of the world was vital. Mm-hmm. But, Oh, it? No, there. It's just yeah. I know. Okay. It was a practice interruption. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it so that helped a lot, right? Because it was it the the core ethic uh, underlying the the octologue was already something that we had accepted in our lives, and of course the the on the creative eth- and the creative ethic uh, from the octologue is uh, the principle, the value of creating value for others or for yourself or at least one person. Um, well, that was already obviously naturally in our family because not only do we not hurt our children, but we actively love them too. So we were always wanting to do things um, for them and, and for ourselves in ways that help them. So I'm curious, if you were talking to a couple who were parents who had yet to adopt the peaceful parenting paradigm, what would be the most important thing you could say to them about your experience that they might want to uh, learn from? Well, <laughs> the first thing to understand is it's very, very difficult to talk to parents who already have children about changing their parenting practices. Yep. Right. Um, it was almost impossible for me. And for six weeks, it was... Not going to happen. It, uh, it, it, there's a, a great deal of it that simply needs to be example followed by answering questions. Yeah. So you have to, the, the only way that we've ever found any, any level of success is to, let, is to let them. Spend the day with us. Yeah, and let, let them lead into asking about it. I mean, there's occasions. It is possible to have a discussion with someone and not change their mind, but affect other people who witness the conversation. Yeah. I do that a fair amount, like on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when, <laughs> I mean, I only do it when I have a, a fair amount of spare time because it's very time consuming. But when people get into conversations where they try to support spanking, mm-hmm. um, I have a pretty good deal of success there in flipping the script on them uh, and, and having other audience members realize just how awful what they're proposing really is. Mm-hmm. Even um, if they don't realize it. Even, even if the, yeah. So the, the other person, the other party involved in the, in the conversation is rigorously trying to defend their take 
but other people who are observing the thing realize that they're failing. Mm-hmm. Um, Very cool. It, yeah, it works sometimes. But <laughs> sometimes I get Lisa involved because the, typically the way it'll happen is somebody will say, well, I, I spanked my kids because there was this scenario and, and this needed to happen and they had to, be, they had to recognize there were consequences. And I'll usually go, oh, yeah, I find that works really well. The other day, my wife put a scratch in the car door, so I started slapping her around and she understands now that there's consequences. <laughs> And then, of course, everybody's like, what? <gasps> oh, my God. Like put up with that? And then she'll <laughs> chime in on the thread and go, no, it, it's really helped. I mean, I, you know, I get and smacked and I, and I turned out okay. Yeah, I got smacked and I turned out okay. <laughs> and the next thing you know, they're like, people are just like, what? <laughs> right. But you hear that a lot. I got... I got spanked, I got beaten, and I turned out okay. Well, it's, 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 right. it's really funny that, that, the, I'll hear people say stuff like, well, you know, you have to, you have to control your kids, otherwise they'll, they might put their hand on a hot stove. Not twice. It's totally, they're not even once. You know what, I, when I, the first time I was worried that my kids might put a hand on a hot stove, you know what I did? I turned on a hot stove and I said, hey, can you guys come over here for a minute? I want to explain something to you. You see this? It's really hot. It will hurt you a lot if you touch it. Put your hand just right here close to it so you can feel how hot it is. And they were like, oh, yeah, that's really hot. And I said, so always be very careful around the stove and don't put your hand on the surface. And they're like, yeah, okay, cool. The end of conversation. <laughs> that was it. That was it. That was like, you know, a, a, a 10 second investment and... I've never had to worry about it, and I've certainly never had to slap a hand away from the stove or anything. Mm-hmm. And if they get momentarily careless and get too close to the stove, I'll say, hey, you know, be careful that stove burner's on. So then I'll try to explain this to someone, and, they're, and they'll, be, uh, they'll say things like, well, you know, what if they just, if they're walking through the kitchen and they're getting too close to the front burner where you're, you're cooking spaghetti or something? And, uh, and I'll go, what? If you have small children, why don't you cook your spaghetti on the back burner? Mm. Yeah, they're, they're well, well, that's not that's not the right burner for. <laughs> I just like wait, I, so you have to hit your kids because you can't move your spaghetti to the back burner on your stove. So therefore, hit kids. I, and and I actually at one point I created a, a Facebook page called like people say Mo, Mo Roads. I created one called Mo Spaghetti, and I was going to, <laughs> just going to do a bunch of sarcastic oh, memes, uh, a bunch of sarcastic memes about how uh, how you have to hit kids so that you know, so they don't run out in the street. Our kids don't run out in the street. We just say, when you get close to the street, be really careful because sometimes cars are driving by and, and you can get killed. <laughs> well, the the thing is, is part of the the authoritative parent parenting is also very lazy parenting because it is a it's based on this. You need to be afraid of me because I'm going to physically hurt you or emotionally hurt you, which means I have trained you to do what I say. That way I don't have to pay attention all the time. And you're never going to trust me. Yeah. Well, and it also, um, so like, I have to be a, a good mom all the time. Like, I have to be aware of my surroundings, or, you know, I help, help watch the kids when we go through the... The, the streets, I have to, you know, I introduce ideas, you know, like we've talked about candles and, and flames and knives and stuff, and I have to actually play with them while they're playing with dangerous things, as opposed to just putting them in front of the TV and say, here's some chips, I'll talk to you in a couple hours. So, like, I have to be an aware parent, and for some parents, I guess that's hard. Um, the other thing, too, when, when you are... Um, when you were disciplining your child, say with the, the, you know, don't put your hand by the stove thing, um, or even around food, it ends up making your kid not trust themselves around these huge uh, areas where they have to learn. So, like, they never learn personal control. They never learn personal boundaries. They never learn personal um, pain or understanding of their own ability to control their environment. And then that's, that's, in my opinion, how we end up having people that have issues with drugs and alcohol and, and you know, all the other addictions because they were never given the option or the chance to examine their own behavior and the outcomes that that, that perceives. So it, it's, 
a huge lesson, I think. And, you know, you don't turn over knives to your kids and, and walk away and, and fire. You, you, you got to show up. It's either it's a job for someone who wants to do it 100% or it's a job you don't want to do and you want someone else to raise your kids. And that's usually the government. And that's not going to happen. <laughs> In this what, what do you think about uh, some of the cultural norms? You know, you run into a lot of, a lot of parents, of course, will have... Well, you can't, you, you know, that's that's rude to do that, or this is this is just not how you do it. You've got to dress like this if you're going to go out, or all these kind of cultural norms. Do you find that you run up against a lot of that stuff and and, and find out that, that those are really meaningless? Or oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's sometimes I mean, it, well, stuff like it's rude to do X. Um, we talk about that kind of stuff a lot, right? In, in fact, a uh, over the past few months, we've been, we've done it the entire time that, that we've been their parents, but um, we've had a very specific concerted effort lately about expressing empathy and regret when something happens. Because um, we had we had an issue the other day, the other day where Meta uh, accidentally hit Axiom in the head with something, and he was crying, and he was very distraught. So she came and got mommy. Mommy went in to make sure he was okay, and then she went off to play and totally ignored the fact that her brother was hurt and suffering. And I was trying to explain to her um, that how, how that would make Axiom feel, that he would feel you know, ignored, and, and, um, and she wasn't quite understanding what I meant. And so I said, okay, all right, I'll give you an example. And I, I picked up something and, and bumped Lisa in the head with it. And she, and like, I actually accidentally hit her a little hard. It really did hurt. <laughs> she was like, ow! <laughs> and then I turned to Meta and I said, Meta, uh, I no, just... No, you walked away. You walked no, no, no. Away. No, I, I turned to Meta and said, Meta, I just hit Mommy in the head with something. Yeah. Uh, will you see if she's okay? And then I turned and walked away and went to Meta's toys and started playing with them. And she... Flipped. She out. burst into tears. She yeah. was so upset that Nathan showed no sympathy for hurting me, and I. She got it. She and that's earlier. I said I think examples of, of of different experiences. For me, I learn from examples quickly. And our kids, we've I've seen learn fast. I mean, when. They, they, they I mean, don't get to say, you only get to make a mistake once and they learn it. They oh, learn man. it. Like, right? <laughs> and okay, so one thing we've we've also experienced is when um, we've made a decision we're going to do something. Say we're all going to get our teeth brushed and we're going to go out to dinner. And then, you know, it's time to do that and somebody doesn't want to do it. And it, we've extended the time a few, a few times. And it's now time. People are hungry. And, you know, one of the kids don't want to do it and... I'm like, well, now you're, you said you were going to do something and now you're not doing it. That's, you're being a liar. And just the other day, last night, Nathan said he was going to play with the kids and, and 30 minutes had passed and the kids were getting upset. He was getting frustrated because he was needing to finish something. And I just said, said to him, don't be a liar. And there's, and he's looking at me like, I kind of want to stay here, but you're so nice. Let me walk away from you in the kitchen. And, and then I went and sat down and watched that episode of My Little Pony that Meta wanted me to see so bad. So. It's it's really it's, there are many times, especially when they're young and you have one that's really young, you really want to do something. And for me, it would be like something around the house, do laundry, clean, focus on something. But if I just spend ten minutes focusing on what they want, I'll get two hours to do what I need to do. It's that I have to put myself back a little bit on the priority and put them on on it first and we are also a good team uh husband and wife and best friends so we know how to help each other so often i do yoga or meditation in the morning so when i come home i'm in the best state of mind emotionally and physically to be the best mom to my children and so that in itself also is important if, you know, there's anyone listening that's a single parent, you know, it's even harder to do this because you do need backup and you do as a human being have days when you're like, I can't do another thing for the kids. I'm at my limit. 
when your partner sh- comes in and because it's not the kid's fault that you didn't sleep or you didn't eat or you're, you know, overextended. It's you needing to back out of the environment, go adjust yourself, have a time out, reboot, and then come back into the equation. And the great thing about having a voluntary relationship with your kids is that you can build that trust so quickly that they'll let you. Yeah, like, I just, yeah. I've, what, told, I've told them, mommy needs a time out. I'm not going to be nice in a few minutes. I'm going to go have a timeout. And they're like, really, mom? You're getting a timeout? And I don't give them <laughs> They've never had a timeout. They out. don't get timeout. So they were like, what is a timeout, mom? It means mommy is needs a few minutes just so I can be a good mommy. And of course, they're like, well, we want you to be a good mommy. Okay, well, then just let me sit in the bathroom here for 10 minutes. And let me just cool off. And it works. So, And when we mess up. One of the most important things for us to do is to say we're sorry. And I don't, I don't know how many people have never had a parent or an adult say, I'm sorry. And when our kids hear us say sorry, when we say sorry, it's so important to see that we're not perfect and to also see that we are on the same level that, we, that they deserve an apology and that they understand that they didn't do anything wrong, that it was my fault for getting upset or packing our day so full or putting something before your needs, you know? Um, and when you have to apologize, it's humbling to yourself. And I think it's easier to remember where you messed up so you don't do it again. So, yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see because, you know, what you're, what you're instilling in your children is, is that they are a meaningful part of the, of the family. And that's essentially, that's the same thing that the Octolog is all about as well, is that each member is a big part of the whole. Everyone is essential. And I, I think that is one of the, the biggest you know, lessons that we can take to the next level, take to our, you know, the rest of society that basically looks at themselves and you know, the vast majority of the society as... You know, we're just foot soldiers. We're just slaves. We're just here to do whatever. And, you know, we just got to be obedient to whoever our leader is. Instead, we could have people that say, I'm an essential part of a t- of another, you know, of the rest of the world. Mm. And, you know, and that's, that's, you know, what we're trying to do. And so I think, you know, even if we, if we put the Octolog into operation in places like businesses, mm. You know, and we say that, you know, yeah, you feel a lot better when you're a part of a team, when you're an equal player, and you've got a say in what things do. And when you've got a creative idea, we want to hear it. Everybody wants to hear what your creative idea is. They can then take that home to their family and do the same thing. I thought for a long time about where is the best place for people to learn ethics? And I thought about schools, and I thought about childhood experience. Ultimately, the childhood is the best. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you look at the bigger picture of the various institutions we have in our world, business is a very, very uh, likely place for people to learn what they need to know about ethics, about having good relationships, about being open, being honest. Business is a, a perfect environment for learning a lot of those things. So I, I see that the application of the Octolog to business is going to be a big deal worldwide. Because when businesses adopt the Octolog, everything changes. And as you just pointed out, people take those changes home with them and they will affect their families and their families' families, their friends. It, it, it's a very self-replicating system when you do that. It, it's, it's impossible not to have all kinds of ripples and repercussions that are beneficial when the core group is acting ethically. Well, I think we're going to conclude at this point here I think we've, we've talked about doing a part two, and I think we'll do that at some point. 
Uh, I know Lisa had talked about interviewing the children as well. I think that might be a, a very important part for the audience to get their point of view as well. I think that would really, you know, possibly really change some people's minds. Mm -hmm. But uh, in any case, we sure appreciate you joining us for this uh, episode. And uh, Bob, do you have any... I just want to thank you, partially for sharing what you shared today, but even more for doing what you're doing. To me, that's the really important part. And I don't know how long it'll be before your children are thanking you, they already do. Oh, excellent. <laughs> they already you do. You certainly deserve it. You certainly deserve they are, it. They already see other parents and they go, thank you, Mommy, for being a peaceful mommy. Ah, uh, great. They see, they see the difference. See the difference. Well, it's a huge difference. And I, I see you as uh, emissaries for a whole different way of being in the world. And I thank you for that. Can I, th can I say one last thing? Um, certainly. One one personal triumph that I have gotten from being a peaceful parent is I didn't have a great childhood so when so I have what some people call soul holes hmm. or uh, damage done to your psyche when when I show up at an axiom in sometimes stressful situations with love and compassion it actually fixes me of course I go right back to when I was a little girl and my parents were like, just, just get yourself up. We got to go. You know, just because you're crying doesn't mean we need to stop what we're doing. When I do that, when I show up for my kids, for, for them the way it should have happened to me, it fixes me every time. And that's, the, that's like therapy for 30 years. That's a wonderful, profound awareness on your part. So, I congratulate you on that. Thank you. <laughs> so, adios, and we will meet again soon.